Okay, so I'm a Chinese Filipino, Chinoy. I was born and raised in Chinatown, the Philippines, the oldest Chinatown in the world. And there's a lot of Spanish influence, and words are in Spanish in the Philippines. They're colonized by both Spain and the US. English is the medium of instruction in the Philippines. I have family in China, I visit them. My dad had a jewelry business in China, and uh, because of Japanese aggression, World War II, and Chinese Revolution, I have diaspora families all over Asia. I visit my family in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in Singapore. My dad was a boat person. He carried gold bars to him around his waist and go to the Philippines. Met my mom and formed a family. And when we were westernized, my mom was from the land of <coughs> class. We were raised as Roman Catholics. We would wear coat and tie, but still would practice Taoism and Confucianism, we have the family shrine. My dad would wear coat and tie, my mom would wear Chinese attire. We have Virgin Mary and Buddha at the same time at home. <laughs> and we have Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, animist artwork all over the place. Uh, my dad and mom like collect art, chandeliers, and we have furniture from Philippine hardwood, mahogany, Spanish style uh, furniture, and that's my siblings and my nephew. And we also practice feng shui. You can ask questions later. And we have mixed influences with the Chinese food and Filipino food. And my dad and mom collect uh, China ware. We have an ancestral shrine too, where all of our dead are located. I was uh, vice president of the international club when I was a student at the, in the Philippines. And when I finished my first master's degree, I went back and taught at the University of the Philippines. And, but I was deeply involved in the social movement with a lot of non-governmental organizations, consumer movement, uh, the churches, did a lot of human rights work. And I, I am still a nomad. I've been invited to India a few times to lecture on human rights, to Bangalore and Karnataka. And I also stayed in the slums in Mumbai, slept there, interacted with the local people. And I was also invited like five, six summers to teach teachers all over the world, human rights, peace, and the laws of war. The Ministry of Education of Germany invited me to talk about human rights and multiculturalism to teachers. I lobbied with non-governmental organizations before the United Nations in Geneva, Austria, and New York. And I came to Berkeley, that's my first trip to the US. I had a lot of friends from Spain and Latin America who influenced me a lot, from Japan, France, Kuwait, all over, I cross enrolled at Harvard, went to France, did French uh, civilization and business French, and uh, did a lot of uh, volunteer work down the zone, down the zone in Amnesty International, and came back to the US, NRU.edu, organizing Asians, organizing Southeast Asians, at Women Shell, organizing Asian Americans. I'm now the training coordinator of International Training Office. We deal with Native Americans, with Muslims, visiting the mosque, and also Jewish synagogues, and Theravada Buddhist temple, and the Mahayana Buddhist temple. And I am a westernized, Americanized, Frenchified, Hispanized, Chinese Filipino. <laughs> Thank you.
build industry. So he was a real visionary, and there's a lot of pride about that in this town. I grew up with this real sense of sort of belonging in this community. And um, my dad had moved there with a job as head of the dental department at Kahamein Hospital, and um, there was always this sense of my family. He always told the story of how for his mom and for my mom and him, things life got better after they came there. So I grew up with that feeling too of good things being associated with that place. Um, and um, I guess I'm highlighting some of that because I think it does influence how I see places I end up in now. I mean, I feel a real sense of rah-rah about NIU, even though I try 50 minutes to get to it. I'm crazy to do that for so many years. But it, it kind of it gives you that sense. Also, you see a, a, a site close to family having a picnic outside. That was one of the things my family did growing up. We, we would go for a drive on a day when it would rain, because in India it's hot. When it rains, you feel great. You want to get outside. Uh, we never sit in the sun. Um, and then you see, you can go to the next slide. Oops, I have it. Um, you know, but a real sense of family and, and getting together to do things. Then I, so I grew up in Jamshapur, and then I went to the big city. I went to Bombay to go to college. I went to St. Xavier's College. You see the library of St. Xavier's on the right. Uh, in Jamshapur, I went to a Sacred Heart Convent School. A lot of, I, was, I grew up middle class. I'm sort of addressing some different aspects of my identity. And most people in middle class India go to English medium schools, which are often run by Christian missionaries, or at least used to be. Now there's more schools that are English medium that are not necessarily run by Christian missionaries. That's the Bombay skyline. Bombay is now Mumbai as a lot of cities in India have gone back to taking their old indigenous names rather than the names that were given by the British who were there till 47, which is also why I studied English from the time I was in kindergarten. Um, and um, that's my immediate family. Uh, as Ray pointed out too, I mean, you can see my dad's in Western clothes and we, my mom and my sister and I are in Indian clothes there. Uh, that was at a party, actually. We're not always in Indian clothes. In fact, I grew up a Parsi or a Zoroastrian in India, and the Parsi community is a small community that um, immigrated from the city of Pars in Iran many years ago. And so we were a minority in India. It's like <coughs> point some percent of us that, that are Zoroastrian in India. And, um, and, I, and we actually are a little more Western in some ways and can get away with things that other people may not because we're considered different anyway. Like those crazy <laughs> Parsis can do that. <laughs> people wouldn't frown upon it as much. Um, but that's in my parents' dining room. You can see there's a Buddha on the sideboard there, um, even though we are Zoroastrian. Um, so there was an inclusion of, of different worldviews. And my dad was a Rotarian, so we saw a lot of pictures of people from all over the world and we got Rotary Magazine every month. That's my mom welcoming my sister in. There's, I think tradition and ritual um, and just things like, even I still do that, bring something sweet when it's an auspicious day. It's just some things that kind of bring joy to my life and smile to others too sometimes. And here's fun with my in-laws and others and you can see there's Again, I, I think I've, there was always for me growing up a real value of getting together with people and um, enjoying people's company. Um, and so those are some of the things I think about when I think about who I am. So as you can see, the term Asian American is such a large term nondescript uh, really in many ways and so we've just heard three short stories of some uh, individuals from you know, Reiti's from the Philippines, Shiraz from India and uh, Lisa from Okinawa and so um, that's really to help give you a context for some of the panel questions that we're going to enter into at the stage and so right now um, we'd like to ask each of the panelists to share with us a little bit about your journey or your family's journey being in the U.S., whether I was traveling to the U.S., the U.S. or being in the U.S., so and anyone can start. Okay. Well, my journey to the U.S., I wrote, it's, it's been helpful to reflect on this. I really appreciate this opportunity to do that and to share my story with you. But as I wrote it, I wrote, my journey to the U.S. involved preparing for taking the GRE, uh, deciding which schools to apply for, uh, applying to them, and then making preparations to leave once I was accepted into the counseling psych program at SIU Carbondale in 1985. I'm dating myself. But I still remember standing at the phone, which was an actual phone, a big thing, uh, on the 
anything rude with this woman coming from India who she knew nothing about. Um, and I'm really thrilled for that because we we ended up sharing a, a house and then an apartment together all four years, and we still are very close friends. And I think rooming with her really helped me learn a lot about this country and culture, although she would remind me after the first month of being kind of polite with me to say, I don't know everything about this country either. Every <laughs> word, name, every cloud, every cloud, and how it goes. And I was reminded that, yeah, I guess I don't know everything about India either, you know. Um, but I think that, that that's something that stands out for me because she did teach me a lot about living in this country. Plus, being in a cohort of, I was the only international student in the psych department that created its own ups and downs, but but I was surrounded by people who had grown up here, and so I, in some ways, I really <coughs> my my learning about the diversity within American culture was really enhanced because of that, because I got to know six individuals who were my cohort really well. One of whom was a lesbian, one of whom was African American, um, others had other. One of whom was very Irish Catholic, and, and so it really that that highlighted for me the value of learning by getting to know people, um, and I appreciated their willingness to know me too. I also wrote that I feel like my journey was also linked to my father's journey, in that he had come here for a master's in dental surgery at Tufts in Boston in the early 1950s, and I think it was kind of a given that I was also going to do this. There was this, there was some energy about that. There was, um, and he didn't tell me how he went hungry when he was here or how hard he had to work. Um, and um, nobody was there to receive him, whereas when I came, I had some support pretty soon after I got here because we had some friends, friends receive me. I, there, were some, there were some Indian faculty families at, at Southern who were very welcoming right from the beginning. And so that's all that I think of when I think of my job, some of the things I think of. Oh, sure. Um, okay, so I decided to come to the United States because I really wanted to study psychology, and it is like 20 years behind in, in Japan. So I said, like, okay, I'm going to go to the U.S. But when I told that to my father, he said, oh, don't, don't go on the highway. You're going to get killed. You're going to get shot. It's all the movies, you know. Because <laughs> well, what I'm saying is that like, that, that media does have an effect on how you stereotype people. But anyway, so but I came but they allowed me if it is okay. Uh, it's okay if you go to Hawaii. Then that's safe for me <laughs> for some reason. So I went to Hawaii and then uh, finished my undergrad. Uh, that was pretty difficult because um, I was an international student. So I only could work 19 hours. So I had to go back and forth to earn money, come back, go home, and come back, and then kind of finish um, my school because my parents were not able to support me financially, which kind of changed. Um, I was able to receive um, the permanent residency, so-called uh, green card through the diversity lottery, which is really lucky of me getting it. So I can understand why, um, you know, students who are under the students, how stressful it is. It's been very, very stressful not being able to have that visa or um, permanent status here. But anyways, that really helped me to have an opportunity to pursue uh, more education. And I went home, worked there for three years in, in Japan, but then I, felt the need to pursue education and a lot of people said, oh, if you if you can't speak English, go to US. So I was like, okay. So I decided to pursue my graduate um, this program here in the United States. And having that um, program residency has helped me to get through this because it helped me to have that um, access to student law, which I'm extremely grateful for because a lot of international students they don't have that. Or like um, yeah, that that would have been very difficult. But, um, so that was, long well, story short, that's how I came to the United States. Yeah, uh, I think undergraduate studies are the same all over the world. The basics are the same, but grad school is really great here. Good ch chance for doing research with your faculty, uh, publication, doing lab work, and everything else. So I came here two times. First was to Berkeley, and two things impacted me a lot. Number one was my friends from the Spanish-speaking world, Spain, Argentina, Peru. And they told me, why don't you speak Spanish? You were from, you are from the Philippines. I said, yeah, but we were ruled for 300 years. So we hated. 
I, I grew up the generation during which we had to learn Spanish. Uh, it was just a horrific experience. But I said, look at it from another way. We can communicate with one another and learn from one another. I said, oh yeah, that's a different way of looking at Spanish. So uh, in the Philippines, we're struggling against dictatorship. I was working with Amnesty International campaigning. And I was able to learn from them the struggles against dictatorship in the Spanish-speaking world. I said, that's wonderful. And up to now, I'm in contact with them. And then I have friends from the rest of the world uh, who are at Berkeley as, as well as American friends. And I came to uh, NIU second time. I, I was in France uh, in between. Uh, and Michelle and I saw each other somehow. I said, hey, why don't you join the core group to organize the Asians and Asian Americans? I said, oh, OK. <laughs> so we came up with our meetings after meetings, or it was difficult. There's no such thing as Asian. Chinese would say, I'm Chinese. Indians would say, I'm Indian. What are you talking about? Like, it was tough. And then this on my, in, yeah. okay, it was in the, like 2000. Yeah, a million years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She's dating me too. <laughs> and then uh, I was also organizing the Southeast Asian, see, so Asian, Southeast Asian, and Asian American, like different groups. And then there's the Filipino Americans, that's another story altogether. And I'm lucky in my work, I do interfaith work, which is tied to my personal interest and in research, my dissertation when I was here. And uh, Berkeley, I avoided Filipinos because it was a uh, time of dictatorship. I was afraid there would be spies reporting my political activities. Mm -hmm. But here I am with a Filipino community, totally different experience. But then Filipinos expect me to go to church every Sunday. I said, I don't go to church. Once mm -hmm. a year I go Christmas, or maybe Easter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they're happy when I go to church. Christmas and Easter. <laughs> oh, hey, you're good. <laughs> for the year. So I, I do my duty as a Filipino. I go to church, Christmas, and maybe Easter. But then when I say I'm also Buddhist and Taoist and Confucian, you say, what? You're Buddhist? But that's me. I'm not just Christian. And then it's hard for them to accept that. And I get racism remarks, even among Filipinos, up to last Sunday. It was repeated yesterday. I said, oh, you're Chinese. You're not human beings. I said, that's racism. And my friends who were around that didn't say a thing. And then uh, here, uh, when I was crossing Home Service Center going to Willis uh two persons in a semi, in a truck, uh, one, the driver said, oh, you, you, F you, go back to your country. You just kept on going. I was just walking. I said, what do I do? Nothing. I don't want to you know, fight back. What's the point? And then one time in winter, somebody hurled a snowboard. Maybe it was the velocity, the speed, the pressure, tension, everything. Just hit me and they were moving. It was so, I couldn't move for five minutes. I just wanted to take the, the plate number. I couldn't even move. And uh, I survived these acts of racism and I'm still 